Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, with all this excitement about camera not working, I uh, completely forgot what we did last time. So let's see. So um, yeah, we did flows. Okay, we had, we did flows and we did the leader executive. Okay, so uh, good. So let's do some reminders then. Reminders. I hate this marker. I'm going to take another one. Uh, so let's see. So first, uh, lead derivative of a function f is just x acting on f. So this is the lead derivative. The lead derivative of a vector field is just a commutator. Uh, the lead derivative of a one form is just the Leibniz rule uh, written the other way around. And uh, the lead derivative of a tensor product well, it's linear under addition, and the lead derivative of a tensor product is just the um, Leibniz rule. And commutes with contractions, right? So uh, commutes with contractions, I'm not going to write it, but that's made clear here for covector fields. Good. So this was one thing that we did. And another thing where we did the flow of a vector field, so phi t. Um, so you solve. Uh, dx mu over dt is x mu of x of t, with x mu of zero is equal any point, and then phi t of the vector x uh, acting on x naught is just x mu of t. And this is this thing here. Good. And so uh, if this vector has, if this ODE has good properties, then this defines something called a one parameter group of isometries. So we had, for example, phi t uh, composed with phi s is the same as phi s composed with phi t is phi t plus s. And uh, in particular, phi minus t is phi t minus one and phi zero is the identity. Good. So these are the one parameter groups of isometries and flows. So phi t is a flow defines this one parameter group of isometries. The other way around, if you have a phi, phi t, you define x is d phi t over dt. Uh, so to make this clear, right? So x at the point x, you let it flow. You let this point flow with the phi, with the flow phi t. Uh, okay, let, let me write this properly x of x is d phi t of x over dt at t equals zero. So it can go both ways. Even given a vector field, you define a flow or at least a local flow. And given a local flow, you define a vector field like that. These things are one-to-one. -one. And uh, these properties here are true 
if this equation has global solutions for every uh, global in time for every point. If you only have local solution, then this uh, reactions are still true for locally, I mean for smaller, maybe not for all TNS, but for, for small TNS, for example, near a point. So um, I will need Eva's help. Uh, so this is paragraph something point something. <laughs> 6.1.2 was the last. So I don't know if you want 1.3 or yeah, point, one point, point 0.2. Yeah, 1.3. So transporting. Fields. So the problem here is the following. We have a manifold M. We have another manifold N. This is supposed to be N. Uh, it's obviously an N, right? <laughs> it's a bit of, of, of a weird N, but well, the name doesn't really matter here. So it could be the same manifold, of course, but a, a priori, it's just any. And doesn't have to have the same dimension either, uh, even. And we have a map phi, which is differentiable, right? So phi is just a differentiable map between two manifolds, then uh, we can uh, push forward of vectors So phi is a, a differentiable map. And M and R manifolds. So we take a point P in M. So we have a point P here. It's mapped to a point phi of P here. Uh, and we take a vector uh, at the tangent space of M at P. Uh, well, we're going to define phi forward. So forward is down of x. And this is supposed to be a vector at phi of p. So this is x and here. I, I don't have enough room to draw an arrow here, but there will be a well, okay, let me just do this like that. So this would be phi star of x. Uh, this should be a vector tangent to n. Uh, at this point, phi of p. And well, what do vectors do? Vectors want to act on functions. So vectors are one uh, first order differential operators on functions. So we just need to take a function. So this is tangent to this manifold n. So we just want to take a function defined on n and act on this with this guy. So I have to erase the right hand side and can start thinking about how we could act with a vector x which is defined here on a function which is defined on n there's an obvious choice right so you have a function defined here we can compose it with the map phi and get a function defined on m and then x knows how to act on functions on m so that's that's how this works
complete disaster. I have to do it again. So phi star of x, uh, so we have a function f from n to r, acting on f is x acting on phi composed with phi. Right, so once again, we have a function f from on the manifold n, I will compose it with phi and uh, then we can act with x on this function. Right? So this is how you push forward vectors. So let's see how this will, will works in local coordinates. So we have co coordinates xi on m, uh, ya on uh, n. So x composed with, so phi will be uh, a collection of functions phi a of xi, x, uh, x on f composed with phi. This is d over xi, d over dxi of f of phi a, of xi. I need a lot of parentheses here. Remember from last lecture, they like to have a lot of parentheses. So this is, this formula makes me happy. Good. So that is just the chain rule, right? So this is xi, and I have to differentiate f over its argument, and then the argument over dxi. So in local coordinates, we'll have that the push forward of xi is, uh, yeah, xi di is dfi a over dxi xi d over dy a. So this is the push forward of a vector field. And now uh, this formula should ring a bell. Uh, why should this ring a bell? If you, well, here I had two completely different objects, one manifold to, uh, to another manifold. Uh, maybe this one has dimension 25, this one has dimension 300. So there are 25 coordinates xi and there are 300 yas. So we've never seen something like that. But if these manifolds are of the same dimension, or suppose that this is actually the same manifold. So this is m is n. And uh, so, so you have the same manifold and uh, you're using two different coordinate systems on this manifold. You're using coordinates xi and coordinates, uh, if it's the same, you would say, uh, uh, well, you wouldn't put a different, uh, different name here, right? So it's the same dimension. So two different coordinate systems on the same manifold. Uh, then this is just, the usual formula for 
how vectors transform, right? So, so then we get x i goes to d uh, y uh, say j over d x i x i. So the lesson of this is that this push forward of vectors, you can just view this as change of coordinates, or you can view changes of coordinates as push forward of vectors. And uh, then this gives you a kind of a nice geometric uh, definition of, of what you do when you change coordinates. Well, this calculation is nothing but uh, the same calculation that we did when changing coordinates, if you think about it for, for two minutes. so. So this is um, uh, this is um, this would be something that you know already more than well. Uh, so this is how we transport vectors from one point to two point, and there is a catch. When we're doing this, we're always thinking about uh, changes of coordinates. So this map was a diffeomorphism. Uh, here I haven't assumed anything like that, right? So this phi hasn't have to be any diffeomorphism or something like that. And this means that you can, th this has an important uh, caveat, namely, I I'm sure that this part of the blackboard looks completely disgusting on your screen. It's just flowing down, <laughs> but uh, cool. <laughs> so there is a caveat here uh, that um, you can, well, I, I shouldn't have erased this thing. Uh, you can uh, move a vector from a point to point, but you cannot, uh, uh, but if you have a vector field on the left hand side, you will not get a vector field on the right hand side. Okay, so that's uh, uh, when phi is not a diffeomorphism. Um, So let me make this clear. But before I make this clear, I need to erase this. Can you see my uh, whole light board well, or other pieces which are cut? No, I think it's pretty well. Okay, just allow me, right? Because I haven't tested this uh, uh, when coming here. So, uh, so um, maps vectors to vectors. But not necessarily vector fields to vector fields. So 
So let's see what can go wrong. So let, let's see examples, right? So examples, if we go from R to a circle and say, let's take uh, phi of X is equal E to I X square. So if I take a vector field, if I use my formula, so this is phi of x, then, uh, well, phi of d phi over dx is just 2x uh, i e to i x square. And so uh, if you think it, about this as follows, so you have a circle and So, so this map is just winding around faster and faster. Right? So you're going from R to here and winding around faster and faster. So this point, for example, I is E to I. Uh, well, that uh, certainly, uh, <laughs> uh, that's what pi half, something like that. So you have the equation that pi half is uh, x square plus n, uh, 2n pi, right, 2n pi. And so there are many x's for uh, i. And each time you change your x, you get a different value here, right? So uh, when you go from one value X to another, so that you come back to I here, this is I, by the way, this is a circle in the plane, obviously. Everyone has recognized this, looks like an ellipse, but it is a circle. <laughs> uh, but I mean, we're just looking tilted uh, on this, right? So yes, but this is S1 and this point is I, right? So you get many points. Uh, so let's see. So you have uh, one point which is mapped here, another one which is mapped here, and another one which is mapped here. And each time they're mapped here, they get a different factor, right? So you don't get a single value of the push forward here, but you get many, uh, too many. But that's not good, right? So too many values. Or if I start here. Uh, but another example is when you get not enough, uh, because you can get, uh, think about a, ma a map from R square to R. Well, from R to R square, right? So just you embed R into R square. then uh, the push forward will be only on the image of your map. So, so you will not get a vector field, but you're going to get only a, a, a vectors defined along the image. And a vector field should be defined everywhere. So another example is just phi, phi from R to R square. You just take uh, X goes to X zero. Then, uh, uh, well, phi star of uh, vector X D over DX, there's one coordinate only, is only defined 
well, this is identity, so it's going to get a x d over dx, but only defined on the real axis, right? On the real on the x axis. So we have r square here, we have r here, r square, and phi is just the natural embedding. So in both cases, you don't get a vector field. So this was uh, examples. What about uh, pullback? Pullback of covectors. Now this one is much much better behaved. And now the notation is phi star. Uh, so we still have the same setting phi goes from m to n and now the pullback goes from the tan cotangent space at a point phi of p to n to the cotangent space at p so phi this is my m this is n phi goes this way, phi star also goes this way from tm to tn, but phi, the pullback, so the push forward goes this, push forward goes from t the other direction, uh, the pullback. All right, so push forward, we're moving things this way, pullback, we're going backwards. Um, I always have to think five minutes uh, when whether I should put this star up or down when writing the pullback or the push forward. And uh, the trick to remember is that uh, pullback has the star up because it looks like the inverse map. Right? So if there was an inverse map, then it will be going from n to m and that's how the pullback goes right so pullback is like the inverse map inverse map is phi minus one which is up so star is up good so let's see so we just take uh, alpha uh, in the cotangent space of n and we want to act with alpha on, with the pullback of alpha on a vector. So pullback should be a covector on M. So we take a vector in N and the pullback of alpha should be a covector, so it wants to act on a vector. Well, you just take alpha on the push forward of X. So this is how you define a pullback, right? So, so you have a covector here. You want to define a covector there. A covector here wants to act on vectors on a tangent to M. So you act with the covector here on the push forward of X. So that's the, that's the definition. Uh, why am I doing this at all? Uh -huh. So now, now this is this is a, this defines a vector field, a covector field always. So that's the nice thing about it. You don't have to to worry about multiple images or anything like that. Uh, this defines a covector field, and I can just see this from the 
explicit formula and coordinates, for example, how can one see that this is better behaved than the other definition? Well, I think the answer is that, right, that this was always defined. Yeah, so, so the, the answer is that this is, this is, of course, defined always, while the other one needed that you'll be on the image and that then aren't multiple images and so forth, if you want to have a, um, a, a, a covector sheet, right? So, so, I mean, this is always defined at the level of the tangent spaces, both maps. However, if alpha is a covector field here, you're going to get a covector field here there. While if you have a vector field here, it's not always true that the push forward is, uh, is a vector field. It's, it is true if phi is a diffeomorphism. Right? So, so because then you don't have this problem of, you have only one image and it's always subjective. So, so you, so for diffeomorphisms, you're, you're good both for vectors and covector fields. So in coordinates. In local coordinates. Uh, so we had Xi on M, Ya on N, so alpha is alpha A dx A, and phi star of alpha, uh, which acts on X I D I, then this is alpha acting on the push forward of X, and we just worked out what the push forward of x was in local coordinates. This is just the rule for changing coordinates. Well, alpha is linear, and this is, uh, well, dya over dxi, xi, and alpha of dA is alpha A. So this is the same as alpha A, dYA over dXi times the one form dXi acting on the vector X. So phi star alpha is alpha a, well, the i component dya over dxi. Which again is just the usual formula for changing coordinates for a one form if the y's are just a change of coordinates. 
if the y's are uh, Um, right, so here y a of x i is just the phi a's in P4, right? Maybe I should have written to be consistent with the previous notation. Maybe I should have written phi a here and phi a here. And phi a here. So so this is uh, pullbacks uh, push forwards, and now you can extend this to tensors by using. Um, Uh, obvious rules. Uh, so this should commute with taking tensor products. And since this is nothing but the formula for changes of coordinates, and you know that how the formula for changes of coordinates looks like, so I don't have to write to you what will happen if you do this to a metric. It has two indices, so there'll be two factors like that. And now we can define the notion of a isometry. What is an isometry? An isometry is a map with the property that the pullback of the metric is the same as the metric, right? So, uh, so that's, uh, that's isometries. So maybe we should uh, define a new section, uh, Eva. <laughs> um, one, uh, 6.1.4. 6.1.4, isometries, right, isometries. So definition, uh, let, so we have two pseudo Riemannian manifolds. Um, pseudo Riemannian manifolds and let me take phi a uh, diffeomorphism uh, diffeo then uh, phi is an isometry if the pullback of H is G. Okay. So that's the definition. Why do we have a, a, our M here, our N here, phi maps here, and then we can pull back the metric using the pullback map and this should be equal to this. A special case would be when uh, mg is the same, uh, nh is the same as mg, then this would be an isometry of the metric on m, right? I mean, this is an isometry between two manifolds. And what we are mostly interested in today is going to be uh, isometries of mg which is therefore uh... so there are a few fundamental facts which uh, I have to just tell you um... the set uh, ISO 
mg of isometries of mg is a Lie group. So they're going to say, well, that's a good joke. We don't know what a Lie group is. So, so what, what are you trying to sell us here? Well, I would expect that you know what a group is, right? So, so I'm not going to go through this definition. Uh, but I can certainly give you the definition of a Lie group. And so a Lie group is a group which is also a manifold. So Mr. Lee was interested in groups where, which have a differentiable structure so you can differentiate uh, So they have some parameters and you are able to differentiate with respect to these parameters. And uh, uh, why uh, do you care? Because analysis is a great thing and it allows you to do a lot of things that you can't do if you can't differentiate. So that's why Lie groups are interesting and important. Uh, short remark in between. Um, I think your definition of isometry, you want to start at, on the top because you're pulling back from NH in the image to MG in the. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I told you that I always have to think where to put it. And obviously, I haven't used the time that I should have before writing it. Right, so isometries, this is a, um, a metric tensor is two covariant. So you're using pullbacks. Thank you very much. Good, so what is a Lie group? Uh, a Lie group is a manifold. equipped with a group structure uh, so that the maps, if you take, uh, so let's see G, so you take G, you go take the inverse and you take a, a product then these maps are differentiable so both maps are differentiable okay. so that's the and as i said it's good because the whole world of differentiation uh, opens to you and you can say a lot of things about uh, these groups and uh, the name of the game is that essentially all groups which are of interest to undergraduate physics are Lie groups <laughs> so of course if you're a mathematician uh, the Lie groups are uh, easy and the real ones are uh, the ones which are not Lee. So the really interesting things are uh, the things which cannot be done by differentiation. But as far as physics is concerned, all groups are Lee groups, or uh, at least for this course. Uh, and um, so, 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 so we have these Lee groups. And what's good about them? Uh, we have killing vectors, right? So killing vectors uh, are. Mm, uh generators of 
one parameter groups of isometries. We already know what what killing vectors are. So, so we have, uh, uh, if you have a killing vector X, uh, KV, then we can associate to it a one parameter group of isometries, uh, one parameter. And we've seen that this goes both ways, right? If we have a, a a one parameter group of isometries, it generates a vector field, uh, and these vectors fields are killing vectors if they generate isometries. Um, so this is one to one. Hmm. What more can we say about this? We've already defined the killing vectors. We already know the equation. Uh, they satisfy. Uh, obviously, I haven't shown you everything that these things are one-to-one -one and so forth. I've only sketched to you how these things work. But, uh, but I, I hope you, you've got a good idea of um, what these things are and how one could perhaps do things completely rigorously in all details. So I've done, I've, as far as I can tell, I've done everything rigorously, but I haven't given you all the details of all these uh, correspondences and so forth. So, but at least you have a good impression of how this works. Now, <laughs> Uh, killing vectors form a Lie algebra. Um. There's one fact which I should have told you uh, that, yes, for uh, the lead derivative of the metric is d over dt of phi t star of g. So this is true uh, for any one parameter group, right? So one parameter of diffuse, not necessarily of isometries. So uh, if this is isometries, then this is zero. Uh, but if it's not, then this is this is true, right? So that's how the d derivative ties with the transport map uh, at t equals zero. And this is a formula which uh, uh, in some years in these lectures I do derive, but it takes so much time that this year we're not going to do. But if you're interested in this formula, that's in the lecture notes, so, so you can find it there. So, so you can see that uh, uh, killing vectors are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, one parameter groups of isometries. And uh, the killing vectors form a Lie algebra. Well, obviously, uh, the additive, right? If x, y, k, v's, uh, 
and uh, a b are numbers then a uh, d derivative of a x plus b y of the metric is just by the elementary properties of the lead derivative it's just a l x this is a constant so i don't have well even if this were a function this would be true would it no it wouldn't right so this is a constant l x g plus b l x uh, l y g Now this is zero because X is a killing vector. This is zero because Y is a killing vector. So a linear combination of killing vectors is a killing vector. And uh, if I take a Lie bracket, then there was this magical formula that this is the same as the Lie bra the bracket of Of lead derivatives. So, this is a, a miraculous formula which I didn't derive, but I told you is true. And then, then this produces zero, and uh, this produces zero. So, this is zero. So, when you have a, a metric and you want to understand its isometries, uh, you just study its killing vectors, which form a Lie algebra. And the point is that the group is that if you give a Lie algebra, there is exactly one simply connected Lie group which goes with it. So that's another fact from the theory of Lie groups. So if you know what the Lie algebra of killing vectors is, you know what the isometry group is. So, uh, again, a fundamental fact, uh, given a Lie algebra, well, let's just say finite dimensional, I don't want to make any claims about higher dimensions, probably true. Uh, uh, in all dimensions, but let me just, in infinite dimensions, but let's just not worry about this. Uh, there exists a unique uh, simply connected group which goes with it. It's not that. Well, associated with it, right? So. In our case, we're interested in isometries. So, so uh, what this says for isometries, uh, what this says for isometries is that uh, knowing killing vectors and uh, a unique associated. So the lesson is, uh, 
right? So killing vectors, the algebra of killing vectors determines there is another to catch uh, uniquely uh, the connected component of the group of isometry, component of the identity I'm sure that you're completely confused now. And this lecture is much more confusing than it needs to be. Uh, so one way of thinking about it, killing vectors and isometries are in one to one correspondence, almost. Uh, uh, so up to covering, so. And this up to coverings has to do with the simply connected business. So two things here, right? So the connected component of the identity. So let me, this is clear if you think about the group of uh, um, isometries of, uh, of Rn, right? So just take Rn, then the isometries are translations and rotations and uh, and so, uh, uh, so translations and rotations are all preserving the orientation, but you can change the orientation and again apply translations or rotations, you're going to get isometries. So uh, the group of isometries of Rn has two components. One is the component of the identity, and these are all isometries which are preserving orientation. And the second one is just compose one of those with uh, uh, any map which changes or any isometry which changes orientation or reflection or whatever you want. So, uh, so this is uh, the connected component story of the identity, right? So. Uh, killing vectors are associated with one parameter groups of isometries. Uh, one parameter groups of isometries always pass through the identity map because uh, phi zero, if you have a, a, a one parameter group phi t, then phi zero is the identity, right? So the identity map is always there. And the identity of the group of isometry is the identity map. So Cleaning vectors determine you this thing, but they're never going to tell you what happens uh, with other components. You can have discrete isometries, um, which killing vectors don't know about. So one has to be careful here. In particular, there are manifolds which only have uh, discrete isometries, and then, of course, uh, no killing vectors whatsoever, and a lot of discrete isometries, and that's. Uh, interesting to study, and there are whole books about Kleinian groups and things like that, which uh, which uh, uh, don't do what you want to do here. Uh, what is this uh, simply covering business here? So let me show you an example, uh, which you can do in your living room. Uh, take a book and I can rotate it by 180 degrees like that, right? So I start with this book here and I can rotate it by 100 degrees like that. And uh, so the book came to the same place where I started, but my elbow didn't. Uh, so you can just try it yourself. You're going to find yourself with an elbow in an awkward position, but I can keep rotating the same direction and now my elbow comes back to the same position so i encourage you very strongly to try it yourself right so do one rotation and you're all tw uh, twisted and then you make another one and you're good 
So uh, this, the fact that doing a rotation by 180 degrees, you're not coming to the same place with the elbow means that the group is not simply connected and uh, of rotations. And however, if you do it twice, it will be. So the thing which does the rotation twice is called the spin group. It's a double cover of the group of rotations, which precisely incorporates this information that you need to do a rotation twice to come back where you started when you're doing it with your elbow. So this is a covering business. So the group of rotations is not simply connected. It has a covering, a double covering, which is the spin group, which is, spin, which is simply connected. And the spin group is of course, something very important for quantum mechanics because you have spinners and all this nonsense with electrons and, 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 and stuff like that. So uh, good. So, so this is uh, the story about uh, killing vectors and algebras. And we are interested in um, studying killing vectors because knowing them will tell us what the isometry group is, or at least the connected component of the group of isometries. And and that's what we're going to do now. So, so just again, let's make it clear. What we're going to do is to study now the set of killing vectors, the Lie algebra of killing vectors, uh, its properties, and this will allow us to understand isometry groups. Why are we interested in isometry groups? Because there's this, this ridiculous cosmological principle which tells us that the universe should be homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, well, not quite, but the universe has a time function so that its level sets are homogeneous and isotropic. And what we want to do therefore is to understand metrics which are homogeneous and isotropic. And for this, we need to know what uh, the associated groups of isometries are and for this, we look at killing vectors. So that's a long story. which we're going to continue now. So it's going to be more on, uh, is it one still or something like that? And 15 or? Um, point 0.1, point 0.5. Five, six? Five. Five, okay. So more on killing vectors. And so uh, the defining equation, we've already seen it. Uh, P mu x mu plus T mu x mu is zero. Uh, there is a fact which goes with this, uh, that every killing vector satisfies this equation, d nu x alpha is r uh, mu nu alpha beta x beta. I hope this is right. So when I have to write this equation, I always have to think a little about where to put the indices. So I know that the second derivatives of a uh, killing vector are the Riemann tensor 
times the skinning vector. So this I remember. Then I have to remember about the indices. And uh, the way I remember is that first they have to come in the same order, right? So you have mu nu alpha here, they come as mu nu alpha here. And the second, uh, this is a killing vector, which means that the matrix of first derivative is anti-symmetric, right? This is what this equation is telling us. Take the matrix of first derivative of X, then it is anti-symmetric. So the right-hand side should be anti-symmetric under nu and alpha. So, but that's what the last two indices of the Riemann do to you, okay? So I know that this new alpha should come as last two indices because of, it should be anti-symmetric and the order is the same. So that's the only position. So uh, I think you've done this in the Übungen, but this is an important fact. So let's, let's do this. So we take one and differentiate. So we take d alpha of one. We're going to get d alpha d mu x nu plus d alpha d nu x mu equals zero. And the standard thing, if you have a three index operation to do, you take cyclic permutations. So you don't even think about what to do, take a cyclic permutation. So uh, you also get d mu d nu x alpha plus d mu d alpha x nu equals zero. And the third is d nu d alpha x nu plus d nu d nu x alpha. What did I do? Uh, this should be a mu. d nu d mu x alpha equals zero. Let me check this, right? So this is the alpha acting on the symmetrization of the derivatives of x. Now, cyclic means that mu nu alpha is the order. And then I need mu acting on the symmetrization of the derivative of x. And the third one is nu alpha mu. And this is new acting on the symmetrization. Okay, good. So now I just add two of them and remove one. So let's just uh, do it like that. So so this term and this term is going to give me a curvature term. term. Right, because I have d alpha mu x nu minus d mu d alpha x nu. So I'm going to get r uh, alpha mu nu sigma x sigma. From these two, this one with this one gives me another curvature term, which is plus R now alpha nu. Please correct me if I have the indices wrong when I do this. And I have these uh, Uh, two, which, which, which ones are left? No, th these two are left, right? But they're, they, they're adding, they're, well, so they're kind of the same, but with, the, with different indices. So let me write them minus d mu, d nu, x alpha minus d nu, d mu, X alpha.
d mu d mu x alpha. So this one I can also rewrite using the curvature tensor. Then this is equal if I change the order to get the same guy as this one, d mu d nu x alpha plus a curvature term or alpha sigma mu uh, nu mu x sigma. What next? So this one is, uh, but uh, let's see, how should we do this? Let's just not do that to make a mistake. Let's keep the sign with it, right? So we had a minus here. So this is this minus carry over like that. So here we can probably use the second Bianchi identity. Uh, on which one can we use the second Bianchi identity? So let's write all these terms uh, so that alpha is at the first place. Okay? So that it's going to be clearer. Then we get minus two d mu d nu x alpha. And then we get plus r alpha mu nu sigma, just change the order of the pairs, plus r alpha nu nu sigma, and minus r alpha sigma nu mu x sigma. So how would uh, second Bianchi help us here? So this is mu nu sigma. This is uh, not, uh, so this is not cyclic, right? This and this is not cycling. Here we have, uh, let's see if we change the sign here, will we get something cyclic? If we change mu with sigma, we're going to get sigma mu nu, that will not work. And this one, if we change nu with mu, we get sigma mu nu, sigma mu nu. Okay, this is going to be r alpha sigma mu nu. And now we can use this one, this one, and second Bianchi to get, uh, right? This is now this is cyclic mu nu sigma, mu nu sigma. The third one is missing. So this produces, uh, so, so this one didn't change. This one didn't change. Well, let me continue here. Um, this one is, uh, okay, so plus R alpha nu mu sigma, this one didn't change. And these two, when I use second Bianchi, uh, this is going to be minus the third permutation. And what is the third permutation missing? So we had mu at the first place, sigma in the first place. So we had nu at the first place after alpha. And then we wanted to have nu, we have sigma mu. Wow. Okay. So this is second Bianchi. And these things are the same, right? Because they just differ by a, a sign. So these two are two R alpha nu mu sigma x sigma. So it's, it's a bit of work, but it's not too bad.
Yeah, so the last step you're using uh, second Bianchi identity, right? So that the cyclic permutation, if you fix the index alpha, make a cyclic, cyclic sum of uh, the last three indices is zero, right? So that's the, the missing one was this one and the sum is zero, so I put a minus in here. So now everybody, including me, is a bit nervous, nervous if we get the right equation. So do I get the indices the same as in my uh, claimed equation? So, so all this was, uh, was zero, right? So we have that zero is equal minus 2d mu d mu x alpha and plus 2 alpha mu mu sigma x sigma the same as saying that d mu d mu x alpha well the two goes away i put this on the left hand side and i change the order uh, the pairs here so mu sigma alpha nu uh, if i change the orders i get mu sigma alpha nu x sigma which is the same as minus r sigma mu alpha nu x sigma and which is the same as r sigma mu nu alpha x sigma so i have the right order right so mu nu alpha here mu nu alpha here and sigma i can hardly believe it each time it works <laughs> but well at least uh, that's one instance when you see the interest of having the bianchi identity the second bianchi identity one doesn't use it that often so uh, it's probably a nice exercise to to do this and to use this second bianchi Maybe I should have written the second Bianchi identity as I was doing the calculation because perhaps many of you forgot it. So let me just make sure that we know what you're talking about. R alpha mu nu sigma plus R alpha nu sigma mu plus R alpha sigma mu nu is zero. Right? So this is the second Bianchi identity. Just a minor thing, but I think that's the first Bianca identity. <laughs> the second one's more of the component. And images. this is the first Bianca identity. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, the second one is the differential one. Why did I think second? Somehow first sounded too easy. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, this is the first Bianca identity. Thanks. The safe thing would have been to say the Bianchi, one of the Bianchi identities. <laughs> so we're using one of the Bianchi identities. <laughs> Shame on me.
Now, what's the point of this uh, equation corollary? Uh, given P in the manifold M, every killing vector is defined uniquely by x mu of p and its first the derivatives. So we're going to do the proof shortly, but there's a corollary of the corollary the dimension in dimension n uh, the space of killing vectors and hence the dimension of the group of isometries is at most n plus n, n minus one plus two equal n, n plus one pi plus two dimensional. So let's do the corollary first. So that this will be C1 and corollary two. This is the dimension uh, of the space of the values at this point, right? So there's at most n values of X possible at this point. And this is the dimension of antisymmetric matrices of the space <laughs> antisymmetric is two M. Right, so this is n by n matrix, but it's not any matrix, it's anti-symmetric. So uh, if corollary one is true, then you have at most n times n n minus one over two killing vectors and uh, the dimension of the group of isometries is at most equal the dimension of the space of killing vectors, uh, which I should have also said before, but uh, well, that's said in this corollary. So, so we, we need to prove corollary one now. And this is going to use And so what we're going to use is the fact that uh, we get an overdetermined system of equations, right? So, so this uh, equations that we wrote for, uh, for the killing vectors are overdetermined. And so
so, so that's the heart of the proof. I could just stop there, right? <laughs> this is of a determined second order. So that's what it must be. But uh, uh, let's see. So proof of C1. Uh, so we take two killing vectors. Let X, Y be two killing vectors. Uh, which have the same killing data at this point P, right? So that X of P is uh, Y of P and uh, DX of P is DY of P. So then uh, we have a killing vector X minus Y is a killing vector because killing vectors form a vector space which has zero data uh, at, at P. Uh, D uh, Z of P is zero and is the same as Z of P. So now we take any two points on this manifold. This is a Q. We take a point P and we just take a gamma between a curve between P and Q. a differentiable curve between P and Q. Uh, let's see, what can we do with this now? So we can write, uh, well, gamma dot uh, mu t mu z alpha and uh, gamma dot mu t mu d alpha uh, d uh, X, uh, Z, so what I'm trying to do is to write a system of equations along gamma for uh, z and its derivative, okay? So, so that's what uh, we want to do now. And the idea is that we're going to have a first order ordinary differential equation, which is linear for uh, these two objects z and the derivative of z. And, um, Uh, with zero, so first order, zero initial value, then the solution is zero. That's the idea. So we want to write a first order system of equation for Z and its derivative. Uh, so that uh, yeah, so that its solution is zero and then we're done. So that's the idea of the proof. And I have one minute to do this. Actually, I have zero minutes to do this, but uh, it's still uh, finished this. So, so, so this thing is going to be an identity and this is going to be a, an equation. That's how uh, this thing works. Uh, 
so, so that's the idea here. So, uh, so we said uh, A alpha beta is D alpha Z beta. Then, well, D over, uh, so along this curve, so along this curve D over DS, the derivative along gamma, is gamma dot mu uh, uh, d mu z alpha is therefore gamma dot uh, mu a uh, mu alpha and d over ds of a mu alpha is uh, gamma dot mu uh, say gamma dot uh, uh, beta d beta a mu alpha is gamma dot beta. Well, this is d beta d mu z alpha, but this is a killing vector, so this is gamma dot beta r lambda beta mu alpha. Z lambda, right? So, in other words, D over DS of Z alpha and A mu alpha is linear uh, expression. So, uh, homogeneous expression in. Z and A. With zero data, uh, zero data. At P, that means that Z alpha is zero. Z alpha of S is zero for all S. So Z alpha of Q is zero. So that's the proof. Sorry for going over time a little bit. And uh, questions? No such thing. So just uh, a, a preview of next time. So now we know what the maximal dimension of the group of isometries is. And uh, uh, we're going to be able to construct all uh, maximally symmetric manifolds. And these are the ones which are going to be relevant for cosmology. And once we have constructed them, we'll start to do physics on the, on the relevant space time. So that's the program for the coming weeks. And uh, see you. Uh, let's see, it's Thursday today, right? So next week. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. See you then. Bye. 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 Bye.